one things that I wanted to do is to take the time to welcome the next speaker. I don't know if you have ever met him or you know of him. This uh, unknown person is a professor of ecology and a distinguished sustainable scientist at the Arizona State University where he directs the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. So if I say you, so if I tell you that, how many of you have guessed who is the next speaker? They have a program on. Oh, they have a program. Okay. So if you have a program, you know that the next speaker is our own Jim Helser. Let me tell you from his Wikipedia page, if you don't know of him, that uh, Jim Helser is a National Academy of Science member, is a well-known American ecologist and limnologist, no, limnologist, yeah, that, well, uh, second try is uh, best. He's also the director and the uh, Bierman Professor of Ecology Flathead Lake Biological Station at the University of Montana. And this morning we heard that Montana is warmer than uh, Phoenix, Arizona today. Um, so he has a lot of uh, knowledge about phosphorus and he also wrote an important book about phosphorus that we would like to feature at the end of his talk. So without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, Jim to the podium. Thank you, Jim. World famous American <laughs> ecologist. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Ross. All right. Um, there was a time when phosphorus had no past. That is, just the first few hundred thousand years of the universe, phosphorus did not exist yet because the atoms had not yet fully um, formed in the form of uh, in getting all their electrons and protons together. And so you might think that those processes of stellar nuclear synthesis and such are uniform um, around the universe, but it turns out they're not. And the cosmologists, it turns out, are still trying to figure out why some parts of the universe are more, and stars are more phosphorus rich than others, which is pretty stimulating, I think, because in a Star Trek kind of way, I like to think there's parts of the universe or galaxy that are more phosphorus limited than others. Maybe, and which one do we live in? Do we live in the phosphorus near a phosphorus abundant, a phosphorus abundant part of the universe or a low phosphorus part of the universe? Now, I don't understand any of the papers I've tried to read about this topic, um, but I think it's never less intriguing. And it shows you in this graph what that looks like um, when you have the more phosphorus rich stars. But let's move to more recent times when we do have some familiarity. Um, Humans, of course, have been interacting with phosphorus for a long time and affecting it even before we knew what it was. And uh, managing to maintain agricultural systems and, um, and their societies for long periods. Um, a good example of this is uh, shown in the Terra Preta in Brazil and the Amazon, where uh, cultures um, have uh, created nutrient-rich soil islands in the infertile um, uh, soils of the Amazon, and these are maintained by, by active processes of burning and um, local cultivation and disposal of waste materials, and they're widespread apparently. And another interesting aspect of this work is that um, a lot of the soil buildup is attributable to charcoal and burning practices, and so and many of us here are interested in biochar, for example, as one of the ways in which um, uh, we might manage soil and build soil and build uh, nutrient management um, materials. So um, there's a lot to learn um, from these past societies and how they were able to uh, maintain soil productivity um, and food production in their environment for very long time periods. Another example is in China. Uh, if you're familiar with this book, Farmers of 40 Centuries, written by F.H. King, an old school. Um, agronomist, I think. Um, I've not read this entire book, but it's really quite an amazing um, chronicle of what uh, Chinese agricultural systems were in the past and what they were, you know, early, you know what they still were in the 19th century. Um, a very, very intensive, very uh, productive agricultural system was maintained in China for 4,000 years. Um, by these practices. Of course, those practices were very labor-intensive, 
right? The input they didn't have, you know, uh, modern industrial machinery, technologies, and fossil fuels that they were taking advantage of. Uh, instead, what the input was uh, was uh, large amounts of human labor. Um, a very important part of that story is uh, the recycling of nutrients that took place, both from animal manures and also human manure, um, were kept in the system, and therefore the um, agricultural productivity was maintained for thousands of years um, in, in, in China. And our uh, current farming strategy or system has only been in existence for a little more than a century. Um, so we have a lot to learn, possibly, from the way they structured their um, agricultural practices. And, and maybe there's things that we can adopt um, to our modern times um, that can also help us um, persist for another 40 centuries. Of course, phosphorus past can't come and go without mentoring the discovery of phosphorus as a historical event, believe it or not. Um, phosphorus was first uh, isolated, uh, the first chemical element is actually purified and isolated by scientists or something like scientists, as Henning Brand was an alchemist, sort of in the birth and transition, you know, to the scientific age. And as you probably know, he uh, isolated phos elemental phosphorus from urine of uh, beer-drinking German soldiers. Apparently, barrels of it were collected. Um, luckily, he didn't have to fill out a human subjects protocol for this study, probably. Um, but in any case, um, pretty remarkable story. Um, and a few years ago, we celebrated the 350th anniversary of this event. I remember going to Lancaster University, where Phil's um, uh, university and organization uh, held a big celebration on behalf of this important event. So phosphorus in the past, um, we first, this is where we first be start to become uh, aware of it as a chemical element. Um, and uh, of course then, right, it was the alchemists were searching for the philosopher's stone, right, which would allow them to transmute base metals or into precious metals. But really what they were after was the secret to eternal life. They thought that if you isolated this essential substance, which come, came from the human body, right? It had contained the vital force, if you will, that allowed people to live eternally. Um, that's a bit ambitious, kind of a goal. I mentioned ambition yesterday. It's probably a little too ambitious a research program. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, they were onto something, right? Because we all know now, you know, now that phosphorus is so essential for all living things and, um, and is limiting. Uh, to life in many situations. One, of course, being agricultural production. And so here's another piece of the past. Here's the Rothamsted Research Station in England, um, where the first, you know, uh, scientific applications of knowledge about phosphorus were made um, in development of fertilizer practices. Um, I admire this uh, operation very much. I run a biological station now that was started in 1899. It's the second oldest station of its kind in the United States, um, but it's nothing compared to um, this operation really. Um, much old, this is much old, older than that, and the experiments that they've per, uh, maintained uh, at Rothamsted are astonishing because they've sustained them for uh, 160, 170 years, uh, which is really quite amazing. So it was founded by John Bennett Laws who began to collaborate with uh, Joseph Gilbert, who was a chemist, and they, of course, had knowledge of phosphorus, and they knew that it was important for um, fertility and living uh, and uh, organisms. And so they began a series of classic experiments at Broadbach Field. And on the right-hand side, there's a table of yields, um, average yields from 1852 to 1925. So they already had a 75-year data set in 1925. <laughs> Um, really pretty amazing. Luke Gattaboni would be very happy to have a data set that long, I think, right? Um, imagine if you're, you had data going back to 1853. That would be, that would be something to, uh, to work on. So they've, they've applied a bunch of different treatments with uh, farmyard manure, um, chalk, carbonate, um, and nitrates, and phosphate, and, uh, and examined yield over time. Um, pretty amazing. Um, data set, and so here's a graph of the wheat, uh, grain yields in uh, tons per hectare, it looks like, um, going back to the beginning. And you can see the fertilizer effect there. The unfertilized is the blue on the bottom line there. 
and the second set of lines is the, are the artificial fertilizer and manure, which just track each other, right? They, so it seems like in this experiment, at least manure and, and uh, industrial fertilizer or pure chemical per fertilizers perform very similarly. And then you see that bump at the end. This is when uh, improved crop varieties came online. I call that the Borlaug effect. This is Norman Borlaug's uh, crop improvement kicking in. And so we can see the combination of things that it takes to get um, high yield that we now enjoy in many agricultural applications. Um, part of it is manure, part of it is better, um, better yielding crop varieties. So let's talk about fertilizers in the past now. Um, we're in North Carolina. North Carolina has a very old, uh, very long history in, um, in fertilizer production, but the first uh, phosphate rock uh, mining actually took place in South Carolina. Um, and uh, by 1885, 50% um, of the global phosphate rock production came from South Carolina. Um, that declined over time and eventually was replaced by uh, hard rock uh, mining and also the phosphorite mining in central Florida um, that still prevails to this day for North American uh, phosphorus production. Interestingly, you see Southwest Montana up there. I'm actually, you know, that's near in my neighborhood. There's actually an exit off Interset 90 that says phosphate because there's a little town called Phosphate where there was a phosphate mine that doesn't uh, operate anymore. Um, but over there in Idaho is where Simplot and, and other uh, uh, operations uh, uh, occur for Western phosphorus mining. Um, so you can see a little table here about the fertilizer trade in North Carolina uh, and what was being produced. In South Carolina, um, as I mentioned, the mines declined. And here we can start to see the impacts of phosphate mining. Um, the local people were not happy necessarily about the uh, large scale mining that was taking place. And the environment suffered um, very heavy degradation. And here you can see the riverbanks of the low country literally were gutted and carted off piecemeal as companies dug ruthlessly for their precious crude phosphates to sell. So here's the first sort of tensions between um, environmental interests and uh, phosphate interests in the uh, environmental impacts of phosphate mining um, that took place in, in South Carolina. Another example of that, unfortunately, is also in the Pacific uh, Ocean Fertilizer Islands. Um, this is a really uh, impressive book written by Catherine Tiwa, Consuming Ocean Island, where she tells the long story of Bonaba Island or Ocean Island and uh, how its phosphate reserves were extracted. The island was essentially mined to the waterline almost, um, and the local indigenous uh, people were displaced, and now they mostly are transport transplanted to Fiji. Um, they are, remain politically active and uh, are seeking to be repatriated uh, to Banaba. Um, and the story of that is, um, is told in this book, which is really quite a compelling story. So if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Um, and similar uh, story played out in Nairu Island that you may also be aware of. All right, so now let's get back to the United States. Um, here's a picture from the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, showing the effects of phosphate fertilizer where the International Fertilizer Development Center was started to develop and apply um, modern scientific approaches to crop, uh, to yield uh, enhancement by fertilizer application. And you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or anything to be able to tell that fertilizers have a big impact when they're used uh, in, in nutrient deficient soils. Um, really quite a remarkable uh, increase. I think these are beans under production. And at the time this was happening, this is during the uh, uh, administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he said, I cannot overemphasize the importance of phosphorus, not only to agriculture and soil conservation, but also to the physical health and economic security of the people of the nation. So that was pretty cool. I've, I've uh, said that the phosphorus sustainability movement in the United States will have achieved its goal when another president says the word phosphorus. Because you can search all the history of all the speeches of every president online. The word phosphorus appears once. This is it right here. We got close because, as people know, there was a trade dispute that's still sort of ongoing 
um, in the previous Trump administration um, involving Mo Mosaic and the OCP Corporation. That's still um, um, a rather acute situation. We were close there. <laughs> there could have been an occasion when a president said the word phosphorus again. So that's still my goal, is to uh, have some president say the word phosphorus, and then we'll know that we've achieved the level of awareness and visibility that we might need to solve these kind of problems uh, in any case. But anyway, Roosevelt recognized how pho important phosphorus was, and uh, as do we. All right, so, the, so fertilizers really got moving. Um, around this time, and of course in the post, the early part of the 20th century when the Haber-Bosch reaction uh, was invented for, um, for uh, production of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. And I was, as you've heard, I'm very much a promoter of looking at nitrogen and phosphorus at the same time, even though I just wrote a book all about phosphorus. My other book was all about other elements. And um, Haber-Bosch reaction gets a lot of publicity, but if the only, if the only thing that happened in the early part of the 20th century was the Haber-Bosch reaction, we would not have had the Green Revolution. Because what you needed in addition to the Haber-Bosch reaction to add nitrogen, you needed phosphorus. Because even if you had nitrogen deficient soils, once you added the nitrogen, the soils would have become deficient in phosphorus very quickly thereafter. And of course, a lot of soils are phosphorus deficient, and so you need that phosphorus in the first place. So none of this would have happened um, uh, the Green Revolution would not have happened without um, the mobilization of phosphorus in support of these high yield crops that were um, developed by Norman Borlaug. And you can see that bottom graph there showing the major inflection point in phosphate rock mining. That's the red um, after in the post World War II era that accompanied the, the Green Revolution. And so Norman Borlaug got the Nobel Prize um, for his contributions to humanity um, for. Um, solving the, uh, the yield uh, issues with uh, many of our grains. And, but Laws and Gilbert were sort of shortchanged, I think, perhaps, or maybe even Haber and Bosch were <laughs> as well, because none of uh, Borlaug's gains would have, could have been achieved without simultaneously um, adding fertilizer to uh, soils. And the third thing, of course, on that little equation there is water. The other thing that happened to hugely increase the amount of food production globally was uh, irrigation and the increase of arable land that was brought into production in various parts of the world. All right, so now let's change topics because that's sort of the supply side of phosphorus. Now here's the downstream side of phosphorus. Uh, what about its impacts on water quality and environment? Um, turns out, I think uh, from what I read, 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 this is the first uh, scientific report of an algal bloom uh, in the literature. It comes from um, a report in 1672 um, in a lake in Poland where if you, I can barely read this, the old English there, but um, a green substance causeth certain and sudden death. That sounds bad. I guess the cattle were, um, were dropping dead um, from, drinking, um, from drinking the cyanobacteria-rich water. Um, and I think this was an urbanized area. Cattle are involved, and it was near a city, so I do think this was an anthropogenic bloom. Um, and so that's the first report of uh, toxic algal blooms likely associated with uh, increased nutrient loading in an urban environment. Um, and then, of course, there's a long history of, of such reports and scientific information about it going forward. And then a long conversation took place in among scientists about what was causing these blooms um, in the 60s and 70s when they became quite prevalent, um, especially at the time the detergent agent uh, industry was very active in trying to argue that the problem with algal blooms was not coming from the phosphate contained in detergent. It was coming from all the, or it was caused by all the organic carbon coming from sewage. Um, and so there's a dispute about, uh, about that with a number of scientists, including and especially including David Schindler, um, proposing that it was the phosphorus, it's not uh, other components of, these, uh, of this pollution that's driving um, algal blooms, leading to the very famous experiment, um, as I called this, the most, single most powerful image in the history of limnology, 
the very famous experiment in Lake 226 at the Experimental Lakes area where they divided the lake in half and uh, with a curtain that's shown there. And one half of the lake received uh, nitrogen at levels that are similar to what lakes polluted by uh, sewage and urban runoff receive. Also organic carbon um, added. And then the other side of the lake received the same amounts of nitrogen and organic carbon, but also phosphorus in appropriate ratios. And um, again, you don't need to be a rocket scientist here. It's just like that picture from the Tennessee Valley Authority Fertilizer Development Center. It's like, there it is. And this picture launched, you know, a thousand wastewater treatment plants. And it launched hundreds of phosphate detergent pans. And it was um, the thing that motivated um, uh, so much of the phosphorus mitigation efforts that took place um, in the years that followed and led to a lot of real progress in water quality improvement in many parts of the world, in Europe and the United States, for example, Canada. So here's an example of that. This is Lake Erie. Um, going back with data going back to 1967, where they're estimating the loads of phosphorus to the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, according to what source it is, around 1972, they began being able to distinguish the, the non-point and point sources, and the red is the point sources there, and you can see that in the 70s as we uh, implemented phosphate detergent bans and wastewater treatment, the point source inputs of phosphorus to Lake Erie declined quite dramatically, but the um, non-point sources did not, and the this graph ends in 2007. In the last several, in the last decade or so, we've can seen similar pattern. Um, the total phosphorus loading not changing that much, but as Laura um, mentioned yesterday, what has been changing is the phosphate loading, the available phosphorus inputs to the lake are increasing um, from those non-point sources and, uh, and are driving the problems that we have in western basin of Lake Erie. So the poop emoji and the detergent emoji meant to say that, you know, we solved those sources, right? We had an idea where they were. They were at a pipe that we can control and regulate. And, um, and uh, they were in a specific product. So it's sort of like the Montreal Protocol again, a specific product with a narrow range of applications that could be um, effectively regulated. But um, we're left with the green, the harder problem um, of the diffuse sources of nutrients, which as was mentioned as well, are not subject to uh, regulation by the Clean Water Act and other measures. All right, so here we are. Now I guess we're in the present or something like it, or the near past. Um, we solved the easy problems of the past. You don't have enough yield in your agricultural fields? Add phosphorus to the soil. So we solved that problem. Add nitrogen too, and potassium is also great. So we know that. We solved the problems of soil fertility, and, um, and we know what we need to do to maintain uh, yield. If your lakes are too green, reduce the point sources of phosphorus. So we solved that problem, at least in, the right, in some places uh, in the, with the right situations where we're able to implement those measures. But now we have the wicked problem. We need to increase food production, right? Because as we mentioned yesterday, population is increasing and growing more affluent. We need to increase food production, but at the same time, we have to protect drinking water and aquatic biodiversity from these difficult to control uh, sources that are out there. And so that's um, sort of the problem that uh, challenges at the moment. And here is the wake up call that uh, got me involved in moving beyond just the water quality, lake limnology side of phosphorus and phosphorus cycling. This is the price shock that arrived in 2007, 2008 um, uh, in the phosphate rock market, this 700% increase in phosphate rock that occurred just a matter of months. Um, Mauricio was here yesterday. Mauricio probably had the mo whoever was in Mauricio's uh, position in the 70s and 60s had the most boring job in the world because the phosphate rock market was doing nothing. Nothing was happening. The price was absolutely flat for, for a decade or more until things started happening, and especially happening. And now the phosphate rock market is quite an interesting and difficult to understand place. Um, the bottom right graph is, as of yesterday, that's the index Mundi phosphate rock price, not corrected for inflation. 
um, but you see that we're in the middle of another uh, phosphate rock uh, price spike. It seems to have uh, flattened out in the last month or two, um, but another similar um, uh, fibrillation, if you will, of the phosphate mar rate rock market is underway. Um, so this is what brought uh, me into this broader issue of phosphorus sustainability, and actually this is the only paper I'll ever publish probably in Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, Stuart White and I wrote this paper about what we felt were the national security implications of, of phosphate rock pr price fluctuations and global security issues, because as we know, uh, fertilizer prices are connected to food prices, food prices are connected to food scarcity, food scarcity is connected to political unrest, and political unrest is connected to global instability, which is connected to uh, international trade, and it all comes together uh, to make a complex and perhaps brittle system that needs um, more um, options and more flexibility in how we um, meet these challenges. All right, so that little shock to the system um, started things in motion. Um, in the form of the Sustainable Phosphorus Summit. People started to rally around these questions. And um, so the Sustainable Phosphorus Summit starts tomorrow. And so this is now recent history, and I'm talking about the recent past. The first Sustainable Phosphorus Summit was held in Linkoping, Sweden, organized by Tina Nesset. And this was around the time that Donna Cordell was finishing her PhD. And so her, she was probably, she was the one behind Tina Nesset getting interested in phosphorus sustainability issues. That was uh, followed soon thereafter by the Sustainable Phosphorus Summit that was held in Tempe in January 2011. I think I met a number of people in this room for the first time at that meeting. Um, great thing about that meeting, similar to the summit we're having this week, is that it was organized by graduate students and postdocs. And it was a wonderful event. I was on the co-organizing team. Um, here's the book that came out of that. Carl Wyatt, Jess Corman, and I edited this volume that came out of there. Carl Wyatt sitting right there. Um, this is the launch of his spectacular career. Um, got its start at this uh, at this event. Um, we had a juried art exhibition uh, there, which was really um, a fascinating thing. We paired the scientists with artists for a few months before the meeting, and then we had a juried exhibition during the during the summit um, where people came together. Lots of interesting people came here. You see, Dave Akari was there. Um, there's Kimo Van Dyke, who works for the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform uh, to this day. Um, Stuart White, uh, Donna Cordell is there, Dan Childers, whose work you may know, uh, and a bunch of great graduate students, um, including Jess Corman, who was my, P and Ariane Cease were my PhD students at that time. So this was a terrific event. Led to this uh, book, if you haven't read it, there's a lot of excellent contributions in it from, all the, from various participants at that meeting. Um, and so it's really worth uh, a read if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. Another thing that came out of that, uh, do, uh, that meeting was a cool picture of all of us standing in the shape of a letter P. We're gonna, I don't know if we're going to be able to pull off such a great um, photograph um, on Thursday or Friday, but um, it was fun. There's, you know, if you look at it, Phil Hagerth is back there at the back. He's standing next to me. That's when we started drinking beer together. Um, and so that's when we met. Um, so a lot of interesting people. And Phil Mickelson is in, no, not Phil Mickelson. Um, not Phil. Rob Mickelson. Rob Mickelson is in this picture of the white hair there in the, toward the front. So there's a lot of people you're probably familiar with uh, in this picture. But the consensus statement we called it the Phoenix Phosphorus Declaration came out. And you can read it there, but I don't want to go into it, uh, too much detail. But it claimed, you know, it makes a forthright statement about the challenges before us. And I think it was a good um, um, outcome. And so you can read that in that book that I mentioned. So that was followed by the third summit in Sydney, Australia that was organized by Donna Cordell and Stuart White. I did not attend that one. I don't uh, know very much about what happened there, except um, probably people saw koalas or something like that. Koalas also had need phosphorus. Um, so in any case, and then there was a meeting in Montpellier, and I went to that meeting. It was organized by Philippe Hilsinger. And that was a good event. That's a picture on the right there of, of myself, Tina Nesset, Donna Cordell. So those are the previous organizers. This is how the SPS gets going. The organizers get together and point fingers at someone else to organize the next one. 
And so that was Fu So Song, who <laughs> was uh, singled out uh, at that meeting as the one to organize the next Sustainable Phosphor Summit. So there he is there, um, where we twisted his arm um, for him to organize the following summit. And that took place in uh, Kunming. It was very well attended. About 500 people were there. It's in China, right? So there's just a lot of interesting people and interested people there. Um, there's Fu Suo in the middle with Philippe and Donna and I. Major production values there. They had a lot, you know, if you've been to China in any way or dealt with the Chinese operations, they do things in a big way. They had these gigantic screens that were, were there. They had um, amazing banquets and it was quite a, an amazing event. And they had a, a tour of the local mines. I believe I didn't get a chance to go, but I believe Phil went and that's highlighted in our phosphorus book, his trip there. One thing that did come out of there as a tangible product was this document here called the Kunming Wager. And this will someday be in the Library of Congress. Right now it's in a pile, I found it in a pile of paper on my desk the other day. So the Kunming Wager was a wager that was made during the summit to sort of gauge people's degree of optimism about phosphorus sustainability. And the wager states uh, is 10% in 10 years. At the 10th Sustainable Phosphorus Summit in 10 years, so 10 years from whenever that summit took place, 2016 or 18, whatever that was, Recycled fertilizer will contribute at least 10% of global fertilizer use, excluding manure application and crop residues. So that's the, the uh, wager, the terms of the wager. And so we, I took signatures of people, yes or no. You can see some of the sign signatories there. Some of them have bad writing, just like the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So um, I had to translate them. So Phil's on the yes side, Ludwig's, Ludwig's on the yes side. Uh, Tom Brulsma was on the yes side. Uh, I was on the yes side. I'm at the top there. Dave Bakari's on the no, on the negative side of Philippe and Kazuyi. So you can see there's a mixture of views. But most people were, 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 were optimistic. Now, no one set the terms or the stakes of this wager. And no one proposed the metrics and, uh, and who will judge the outcome. So this is a, worth probably as much as the paper it was, it was written on. Um, so in any case, but this is a lasting document that will someday enter the history books, I hope. If it survives my next office cleaning. <laughs> All right, so that was followed by the SBS in Brazil. I did not attend that one uh, as well, so I don't, can't tell you too much about it. It was organized by Vincius de Mayo Benitez. And there is a proceedings from that. So if you don't, uh, if you haven't uh, know what came, you want to know what came out of that meeting, um, you can go online and find the proceedings uh, from that. And that brings us to the present. Um, so here we are in Phosphorus Week again. And um, the next two, today, well, tomorrow and Friday will be the next iteration of this uh, event. It's going to be great. This one's also been organized by graduate students and postdocs from the STEPS Center. And so we have a lot to look forward to uh, tomorrow and Friday um, to see what, um, what program has come together, um, what all of you will be contributing to um, the success of that meeting. But here's the question, where are we going next? So that's sort of under discussion right now um, amongst the very loose and disorganized group of organizers of the Sustainable Phosphorus Summit. There's been some emails circulating around. There's been a little bit of conversation here at this meeting already about it. Um, current thinking is we ought to have it in Africa. Actually, this summit was meant to be in Africa, but obviously the pandemic uh, interfered and it was impossible to make uh, progress on, on any planning for that. Um, so maybe Africa. Who's going to get the finger pointed at them? Who's going to raise their hand? That's a good, a good question. Um, so if you have ideas about where you think it should go, who should, who would be a good organizer, what organization or support structures might emerge for having the 2024, because this takes place every two years. Uh, come see me or Phil before the poster session. We may actually have a little meeting at the poster session to gather ideas or discuss the topic. So that's where SPS stands. All right, so um, we're now in the present. So this is a little timeline of uh, this phosphorus sustainability movement going back to 2000, I like to show. It's been a lot of important events that have taken place. This timeline starts very artificially with the creation of SARA 17, the Soil uh, Fertility Phosphorus um, Nutrient Management Group. Then there's the Global Phosphorus uh, Research Institute that Donna Cordell uh, started and her later the Global Phosphorus Network. 
There's a sustainable phosphorus summit in 2011 there. The first nutrient platforms start to appear, the one in, uh, in the Netherlands. The phosphorus uh, research coordination network got rolling in 2013, and that brought a lot of people together for several years. Then the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform really got together, bringing a lot of these parties together. They inspired us to create the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, which is sponsoring today's event. And then, uh, you know, the culmination of all this effort is to, is to create the STEPS uh, Phosphorus Sustainability Science Technology Center, which we're going to hear about today with its roadmap, a $25 million um, research and development enterprise that is led by Jacob Jones, who you'll hear from next. Um, so. We're in the present, um, it's exciting, but I think what's most exciting is to think, and I hope it's exciting for you, is that you know, the world's phosphorus, future phosphorus system is being shaped. It's being shaped right now by, uh, by many of the people in this room. Of course, there's, not, there's a lot of people who aren't in this room. We need to get all these people in the room, everyone, because everyone in the world has a stake in the future phosphorus system, and we need to make sure we hear all of the voices um, who uh, will speak for what it takes to get us to the phosphorus future that we all uh, desire, where we all have um, access to abundant, nutritious food, and we have access to clean uh, and healthy uh, freshwater ecosystems and coastal oceans. So um, that's what we're after, and thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to have um, some discussion of my revisionist history of phosphorus that I just presented. <laughs> thank you. All right, if no one has any questions, we're live. Oh, Ross has one right. question, okay. You stand on the approaching the podium. So oh, she just uh, stand between, between so me and you. Quick question. Yes. Charles Dow, uh, Dickens wrote the Christmas Carol, the past spirit, the present, and the future in six weeks. Now six the weeks? The question is, how long did it take you to write your Phosphorus Past and Phosphorus Future book. Oh, how long did it take to write? That's a long story, actually. I started writing it in 20, it took about um, 10 years um, from start to finish, I think. I started writing it in 2010 or so. Uh, I got approved by Oxford Press to do this, and I started writing on my sabbatical, but I made the mistake of going someplace interesting on my sabbatical. I went to Patagonia, and so I wrote a chapter or two, and then Patagonia distracted me for a couple months. And I went back not having achieved half of what I needed to do for the book, and then I sort of was back to my real life again. Kind of poked at it for several years and then realized that I was not going to finish it. Then the Phosphorus RCN started, and I got to know Phil a bit. And so in a true sort of Huck Finn kind of a way, I um, got him to finish whitewashing the fence. Um, I don't know if everyone knows that story of Huck Finn, but anyway, um, uh, so I got him to come in and write the chapters that were sticky, that, that I was stuck on, and he brought the right expertise. Those are the chapters about watershed, nutrient transport, and soil fertil uh, fertilizer management, and these kind of things. So I got Phil involved, so it took about 11 years from start to finish. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask me about this talk. It took me, I wrote this talk on Sunday. We have another question that says, in the famous lake, lake experiments, did they ever add phosphorus without adding nitrogen? Ah. Or was, always or was phosphorus always added with nitrogen? This is a great question. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Yes, they did. I wrote a, a little review paper about this. They had, I uh, can't remember the number of the lake or the name of the lake. They did. And guess what happens? Not as much. If you add phosphorus alone, you don't get as much of a, a green band. It's sort of just like in soil, right? If you just add a phosphorus fertilizer without the nitrogen and potassium, you get less. It's the same thing in a lake. Because the lake doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, probably, at least when you add the phosphorus, Dave Schindler would say, wait a few years. The nitrogen fixers will come in, and they will bring the nitrogen in. This is the whole argument about phosphorus and nitrogen management. The problem is, and this is what the Dave Schindler's... Um, not adversaries, but counter argument would be that nitrogen fixation is expensive, it's difficult, and not uh, and only a few organisms can do it. And so it takes a long time for the nitrogen fixers to solve that nitrogen deficit. Um, 
The other problem, of course, with nitrogen is that there's a pathway of nitrogen out of the lake that's denitrification, and so a lot of the nitrogen you might add gets denitrified during the winter after you added it, so you got to add it again. So this is why people would argue that, um, that yes, you get a bigger green bang from your fertilizer investment if you add phosphorus and nitrogen together um, at the whole lake scale. That's certainly what happens when you do a small scale experiment as well. Um, yeah, so on my Sustainable Phosphorus Summit uh, talk tomorrow or Friday, no matter which day it is, I'm going to actually talk about nitrogen <laughs> um, at the Phosphorus Summit um, and uh, why we need to consider it along with phosphorus.